Welcome back to The Breakfast uh, here on PLOS TV Africa. There are now six categories of payment operations in Nigeria, according to a document released by the Central Bank. At the top are companies involved in switching, processing, and mobile money operations, which will have uh, to show proof of 2 billion Naira shareholders' funds to do business. There are lower benchmarks uh, for all the categories of financial technology companies. And uh, this morning, we are joined by Olumbuiwa Oluwoboyega, a writer with uh, Tech Cabal, to talk about this. Good morning, uh, Mr. Olumbuiwa. Good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. So when the CBN put out this uh, uh, notice, there's, there was mixed reactions. Uh, I've, I also read and I saw a couple of people say, well, this is good news. And it will bring some stability. It would also bring some assurance to people who are getting involved in fintechs in, you know, across Nigeria. Uh, where do you stand? Do you think this is a great move by the CBN um, or you know, maybe too early? I think, there's, I think it's important to state that there's not a lot that is new here, um, part the new regulations in quotes. Uh, most of the requirements remain the same. Um, the shareholding um, and capital requirements as well remain the same. So it's not, it's not a bad thing. I, I think that because of the way some regulation has happened in Nigeria over the last couple of years, we now sort of think of all types of regulation as a bad thing. And this is not exactly the case. Regulation usually can be a great thing and it protects the end user. Um, and, and that's usually where the thinking is from. So, but for these um, um, new regulations in quotes, th there's nothing to be um, um, angry about or to be upset about. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect anybody and it's all good. Okay, I, I want you to help us break this down for people who don't understand all this financial jargon. When the central bank released their new um, circular saying these are the requirements for uh, payment companies, fintech companies, and they're saying, you know, you need to have 100 million Naira shareholders funds unaffected by losses, this, is this, this. For the people who don't really understand, what does this mean? Um, so, I mean, one thing to note is that these are capital intensive businesses that will deal with people's monies. So it's really important that when you set up companies like this, that you can show that you have the required money or capital to make it work. Um, so, yeah, that's basically what the thinking is. It's basically, think of it like, just like a bank as well that deals with people's money. Um, the, the central bank must know at every point that you have the capital to keep the business moving because that's the most important thing for the stability of the business um, so that we don't have situations where, say, three months down the line, there's some, there's some trouble in there about not being able to meet their obligations or not remitting people's deposits or just generally having um, problems with cash flow. So usually that is the thinking when there, are, when there are capital requirements for businesses like this. Okay, so you don't think that these licenses being pegged at $2 billion for this, $2 billion for that, you know, it's not going to limit the entry to people who have disruptive ideas and want to, you know, step into the fintech space? No, it's not. I, I do think that because, like you have said, there are six different levels. So it really depends on where you are playing. Um, because if you are playing at the very top, then one must reasonably expect that you can afford to bring whatever um, um, capital requirement that the CBN asks. There are, there are cat licensed categories with lower entry costs. So, yeah, you can always consider that. But I, I do think that this is fair. I spoke to someone um, at a fintech yesterday. I mean, they thought it was fair and says there are, no, there are no big changes here. So there's nothing for them to worry about right now. Um, where do fintechs um, or startups, you know, like that normally uh, get funds from uh, to, you know, set up? Uh, do they get, you I know, mean, seek loans? So you could, do, you could do a bunch of things. You could, if you have some brilliant idea, get money from family and friends to begin, like, maybe the scratch of your business. You could also bring in some other people who have the money to fund it as well. So, I mean, you have a bunch of options, but to be fair... Two billion is a lot of money. So at that stage, you're playing with bigger players, probably some, if you have some institutional investors, if you have some angel investors, whatever you need to do. 
So still talking about investment, um, we know that most of the investment that we've seen in fig tech companies in Nigeria are international. You know, you also have you know, institutions that basically set up processes to make sure that you're going from ideation to execution. There's SID stars and the like. Let's talk about the place of investment funding you know, in fintech in Nigeria. Do you think a lot is being done, especially by local investors, not just the ones who give you all the billions of dollars? We're talking about local investors now. Do you think fintech companies are getting a lot of that? And what more can be done to ensure that the fintech space is thriving with all the backing and support that it needs? I think an interesting way to look at it is to think of every ecosystem um, in terms of their maturity, right? Every tech ecosystem goes through the same stages. Nigeria um, and much of Africa is still at that stage where we're getting a lot of um, foreign investments, which is very good. Um, but it's, it's not to say that we're not getting a lot of local investors. There are quite a lot of local investors, angel investors, for instance. There are even networks of angel investors. Now there are also Nigerian-created um, VCs or African-focused VCs that are created by Nigerians. I mean, um, Microtraction has quite a lot of investments um, in Nigeria. I know that the Future Africa Fund said the other day that it has made, just in, the, in 2021, I think it has made about 13 or 14 investments, um, which is a lot. If, if you consider that last year, I don't think it made more than 14 or 15 investments in total. So, yes, the foreign money has come in and a lot of it keeps coming in. But there is a lot of participation on the local front, and I, I, I'm sure that that will continue to happen. Um, so what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot more, you know, a lot more of the bigger players come in. Sequoia um, invested in Africa recently. I think it was announced um, like last week. There's another. There, there's a rumor of a deal from Tiger Global as well. Uh, but yes, while this is happening, we're also seeing that. A lot of local investors are putting their money where their mouth is. So that's going to happen side by side. And at some point, you see that a lot of local money will keep uh, um, going in to fund um, the startup. So where, where the ecosystem is at a really great place right now. Well, um, well, some people would also argue that, you know, we probably should have waited a little bit, you know, for us to uh, reach some level of stability with regards to fintech in Nigeria. It's still growing um, it's still, you know, it's a space that not very many people are familiar with. Um, so would you say, you know, that the, the CBN maybe should have just waited a little bit uh, before uh, these um, um, uh, targets were set, you know, for fintechs in Nigeria, um, just to encourage more people to get into the space and to allow for would, more people to, uh, I, you know... To I would say the, that, um, to be honest, one place where CBN deserves credit is in relation to its regulation um, of fintechs. Um, it has done, they've done some really great work. Um, recently, they released their draft framework for open banking, which I believe will be a big game changer. I do not think that this um, lets um, serious people, this keeps serious people out. Um, there's, even, there's even a sandbox where you could come and try your hand out at whatever solutions you want um, to create. So no, this does not keep anybody who is serious out. As we've, as we've seen, um, FinTech continues to be about the, the, the sector that attracts the most funding um, across Africa and, and in Nigeria as well. So I, I do not think that that's going to go away. Um, there's plenty, there's lots of solutions you can think of as FinTech problems and that have FinTech components as well. So that's never really going to go away. I do not think that what the CBN has done is a bad thing. Regulation is super, super, super important. That will always remain important. Okay. Because I, okay. Well, you have to think of regulation as something that wants to protect the end user and wants to keep everything stable. Mm. I would ask more questions about regulation because, you know, like you said, this protects, you know, both the fintech and the consumers. But, or, but looking at fintech in Nigeria, how would you assess just how much impact they've made regarding, you know, when it comes to creating a more digital banking services for people, you know, just all the benefits that fintech has had in Nigeria's uh, financial uh, space in the country? I mean, it's easy, it's easy to take it for granted until you think about things like the pandemic and all the restrictions that COVID-19 brought. Um, when, even when you come to today, right now, if you were going to go to the bank to sort out an issue, 
you need two, three hours. That's just the reality of it. You need two, three hours to, if you wanted to make an over-the-counter over withdrawal. Um, ATMs have never been as filled as they are today. So um, fintechs and mobile money players that allow you to do basically every sort of banking service without going into the bank, they make a world of difference. If we come to things like even digital lending, for instance, um, it has never been easier to get a loan for anybody who has a smartphone and has a new job. You just dial a short code, download an app. Today, there are, what, 30 digital lenders in Nigeria. So these are things that affect people's lives every other day, right? And fintech makes all the difference in ensuring that some ac the access to many of these things, they are easier and quicker than, than they've ever been. Mm. So for me, usually it's... Um, you would find, for instance, I was in Ikeja the other day. You know, Ikeja is supposed to be as central to Lagos as central is. And I, I needed to um, withdraw some cash. And there was no ATM around me. And eventually, I had to use one of the um, agents of these mobile money players to withdraw some money. And you'd be surprised that that's how, many, that's how a lot of people in Lagos get their money today. Indeed. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I've, I've also uh, I think I think a couple of, you know more times you know than you know normal. I've also made use of some of all those uh, agents on the roadside. You know, there's zero queues and zero traffic, and uh, exactly uh, there's not much you know that you can you know you complain about. But let's also talk about um, in what directions you feel. Um, you know, uh, Nigerian fintechs, you know, may also want to expand into, you know, what, in what directions do you think that we are currently headed uh, that is exciting for you and you see us in the next few years? I do think that um, when I look at, for instance, something like digital lending, the fact that there's a lot of players will mean, for instance, that people are going to diversify into other things. It will not just be payday loans. We're going to see someone crack something like asset financing, for instance. Um, I think there's a company right now that's trying to hack mortgage financing, uh, but that's pretty difficult. But that's still going to happen. What we're going to see is, because right now, if you look at fintech, you, you, you see that a lot of it is focused on just payments, um, receiving money, paying money, transferring money to someone. You know, A lot of fintechs are going to dig below the surface, and it's going to be... A lot more complex. They'll come up with more complex solutions. Right. Um, so because there, right. there are services like insurance, um, there are services like loans, you know, there's there's a lot more, you know, complex services than just withdrawing money and transferring money. So but this is the first step, right? And even with this first step, there's still a lot of places, a lot of these fintechs have not got into, right? So two things will happen. We're going to we're going to expand access, okay. and you know, just by the just by the sheer demands of competition, we'll see people expanding to more areas. All right. Other, right. Other, um, Olumuiwa, Olumuiwa, writer at Techabao. We'll, we'll apologize. We have to we have to wrap it here. Olumuiwa, Oluwogboyega, writer at Techabao. We appreciate your perspective on fintech issues every time. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Our next conversation on The Breakfast will be on the ongoing constitutional review. We have a political affairs analyst uh, to discuss this with us.